morning once again, everybody. So good to see everybody. Hey, guys, do me a big favor. My name is Pastor Eric. I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. And if this is your first time joining with us today, hey, thank you so much for being our, our guest. We kind of an honor and a privilege you decided to come with us today. And, you know, we're, we're just about helping people come to know Jesus. And, uh, you know, I just got here maybe a little before you did. If you're not a believer in Christ yet and you're still trying to struggle and understand your faith, listen, we're not better than anybody else. But Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that. We believe he rose again from the dead and that he gives us power and grace in this life that we can do all things through him. And so we're just a community of people that believe in Jesus and we want to encourage you where you are in your journey with Christ that you would join Jesus and and become more like him. He's made you with a purpose and a reason. You're not here by accident, everybody. And so we just want to welcome you. And, And if it's your first time here, and everyone that's watching at home, if you're at a camper, I know people have got their campsites going already. If you're at a campsite or you're at home, whatever, can we just uh, do me a big favor? Welcome all the first-time guests and also those that are watching online, nice and loud. Well, it's so good to see everybody today, and we're so glad that you're here. And we're in the process of going through this series on the Sermon on the Mount. And today we're going to talk about revenge. I like revenge, right? How about when someone does something to you and you want to get back at them? Let's, I, I have to be honest with you. I happen to like revenge stories. I like revenge movies. And my last name is Bucci. Okay? I'm Italian and German. In fact, my grandfather was in the mafia. Okay? I make a phone call, take care of it, all right? Hey, Louis. Hey, Pastor Bucci, what's going on? Hey, take care of this person for me. Sure thing. They'll never know what happened to them. I'm just kidding. That doesn't happen, okay? <laughs> but all kidding aside, well, we like revenge, right? We, we like revenge. They need to get what's coming to them. It's not right what they have, and we like the way it feels. Maybe you don't, but I do naturally. But, you know, God is calling us to a greater way to live our lives. I heard of a story of a man that was running to the airport. How many folks like going to the airport? About 35% of flights right now are either delayed or canceled. There are not enough pilots out there right now. Anyhow, you go to the airport, you wait. I heard of a man that was in a rush. He's trying to get as fast as he could to his flight. He gets to the curbside at JFK. He wants to check in his things. And this curbside uh, person, is this young man, is taking so much time. He's trying to explain what's going on. He's taking his sweet time. He's looking at his clock. He starts ridiculing the guys. What's wrong with you? You're lazy. Do this, do the other. And so he was just just doing a bad thing, really rude to him, and just dehumanizing him. And so the man was so cool and calm and and collective, and the man goes away. The next person comes in the line and says, I'm amazed. I'm going to talk to your supervisor. You had such class. How do you keep your cool? Oh, so it's not a problem at all. He's going to New York City. He's He's going to Atlanta, Georgia, and his bags are going to Paris, France. The fact that you laugh about that shows me your heart. <laughs> but we all, like, we all like revenge, let's be honest. We, we, we want someone to get theirs, right? We do. And we see this happen all the time in our lives. And today we're going to be talking about it, what the Bible says about revenge. And there are people out there that say, hey, man, it doesn't make a difference. There are pacifists out there that don't believe in war for any sets of circumstances. The Bible says that you shall turn the other cheek. You shall not repay evil with evil. Therefore, it's not our objective to fight anybody. We're just going to be passive. There are people out there, I've heard stories, I'm not going to give you the examples right now, but they've watched their family be attacked and they stood by saying, well, the Bible says. What does the Word of God say about this? What are we to do with revenge? When we are wronged, what happens? What do we do? Well, I'm so glad you asked because... Revenge feels so good. You know that song, reunited and it feels so good. Revenge, it feels so good. Right? I mean, it feels good when someone gets theirs. Let's be honest, it is. But you know what has to happen, everybody? If you recognize who you and I are without God, and, and really how wretched you and I are without God, I don't think we recognize how messed up we are without God. And we have the sense of that we're better than somebody else. And we have a sense that they should pay. What do we do about revenge? How do we handle it? What does Jesus say about it? 
Of course, the great prophet said, revenge is a, di revenge is a dish that tastes best when it's cold. Of course, that's the godfather. I'm, I'm a heathen. I'm sorry. But guys, I have permission to make fun of my own people because my last name is Bucci. So if you're offended because you're Italian, I'm Italian. But, you know, people think that, right? Revenge is a dish best served cold. They're going to get theirs. How many of you ever secretly rejoice when someone, maybe someone that had the perfect kids, all growing up since they were babies, they were in the 100 percentile, yours is in the 15 percentile, and they, they're on every sports team, that they're on the honor roll and all that, and finally you find out, oh, they flunked out of school. That's so bad. And you feel good inside. Or how about you hear about someone that maybe, uh, maybe in high school or something like that, they were always better than you, and you find out that you know, they cheated their way through, and you feel good when they fail. I, almost like a revenge. But how about all the evil going on in the world? What do we do with it? How do we handle the situation? Well, I'm going to read to you right now. It's a Sermon on the Mount. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus spoke this sermon on the, sea, on the shores of Sea of Galilee, which we did as a church where 40 of us went to the very place we believe Jesus was. And on a sloping hillside, he spoke to his disciples and other people that were to become his disciples. And it's called the Sermon on the Mount. It was the most wonderful words of Jesus. It's the longest discourse in the Bible from Jesus. It is controversial. It cuts right to the core of a human beings. It is, it's very hard to dissect and understand in some ways, and you'll see why in a few moments. But we talk about this, and we get to this segment right now. I'm just going to go ahead and read it, and I want you to listen to it and, and see what it has to say, okay? And then we'll go ahead and break it down. Here's Jesus. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too away. Give to him who asks you. And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. What on earth? That's a hard one, right? I, and allegedly, Gandhi said this. I'm not quite sure who said it, but an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And so people would say, you know, uh, we don't pay attention much to the Old Testament anymore because the Old Testament was the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. In fact, there are people that believe this. You know, Jesus' teachings before the cross are not valid. Only what we know about Christ after the cross is valid. Uh, we need to disconnect and we need to decouple the Old Testament from the New Testament because, after all, we are under a new law now. And what, there, is a, there is a move that's been happening since the beginning of the church to parse the Scriptures and to take away what you do not like and what you do like and make exemptions. We see it happening all the time. But what does the Word of God say about that? What Jesus says is impossible and it seems kind of reckless, right? Don't resist the evil one? W what does that mean? I are you suggesting that, like, like that person I heard about, that whose family was attacked, that the, the father just stood there saying, the Bible says I can't resist the evil one, God will take care of it? And the person's hurt? What's the story with that? Are you telling me that someone breaks into my home, I'm to do nothing? Uh, are you telling me that we're let these war crimes happen and sit around and do nothing? What are we to do? And so I'm not saying that Jesus is reckless, but if you look at this, it seems like it's reckless. In fact, a lot of the problems that we have is we misquote the scriptures. Listen, I'm all for memorizing scripture and quoting it and praying it. But if you pull a scripture verse out of its context and quote it and pray it, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. Context rules scripture. You have to look in which the context of scripture is. That's why you need the whole word of God. You don't just take one section and quote it. So when you read these things that Jesus is saying, we need to understand the context of what he's saying and how we break it down. Now, we've been talking about this, all right, and we're going to review for a few moments about scripture. It's just said six times in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it, it was said. Not only that it was said, 
but it was taught. You know what, you know what they, you know, you guys ever hear of that statement? You know what they say? I don't know who they are, but even back then, you know what they say. What's they? Well, this is what the rabbinic and Judaism law and the Mishnah and other places talk about. This is what we are to do. You've heard it was said, and Jesus would take what was said, what was taught about the law, and what he would do is he would break it down and he would dissect it and he would show the error of it and he would get to the very crux of the heart of humanity. Because listen, everybody, you and I are like a bunch of lawyers trying to squeeze our way out, trying to find loopholes to advance our own personal agenda, and we want to do what we want, yet we're still following the law. They call it cooking the books. So we talked about these various things. We, for the first week, we talked about anger. Jesus says, if you're angry with your brother, you already committed murder. So before we get to our hands doing it, if it gets to your mind and gets to your heart, it gets to your hands. But if you deal with it with the right type of thinking and the change of heart, it never gets here. So Jesus goes to the very core of it, not just looking at the behavior, but looking at the very genesis of behavior. Talks about lust. And they had all these ways. Well, it's not adultery if you do this. He says, if you look at lust with a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. You can go back and see the, the scripture, I'm sorry, see the sermon series to catch up with this. He says, it's in your heart. Talked about divorce and adultery. Then we talked about making vows. Now today, it's about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Don't resist the evil one. So this is what I expect to happen. If your son or daughter's playing hockey and their tooth gets knocked out, as a Bible-believing, full gospel, Old Testament and New Testament Christian, you ought to knock out another kid's tooth that knocked out your kids. Amen? That's what the Bible says, right? Well, people read that and, and think that's what it means. But this is what Jesus says. All right? This is very important we understand. And people would say, that's the Old Testament, this is the New Testament. We talked about the different types of Old Testament law, which I don't have time for. You can catch up with the series at cornerstonecheshire.com. But do not think I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. By the way, not only cornerstonecheshire.com, but um, Apple iTunes, say Cornerstone Cheshire, or Spotify, Cornerstone Cheshire, and you can catch up to the, the sermon series audibly and also on YouTube and our website and catch up. Okay, I just want to let you know that. All right. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill, Jesus says. For as surely as I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, has heaven and earth passed away? Why am I repeating this? Because I see so many people dissecting and tearing up the Bible and putting it in different categories and trying to annul it and say it's not really void, it's void because we have the new covenant today and they take it out of context. It's so important that we understand that all scripture is God breathed. And so this is what Jesus said For I shall I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, no one tittle, by no I means punctuation, by no means will pass from the law until it's fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This would blow away everyone that heard it because these scribes and Pharisees memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. Take your Bible, look at that. They memorized it. In fact, they would even tithe on spices. Before they put salt on their fries, they would take 10% of the salt away. I mean, they were extreme. But they found ways to dance around it. Only allowed 200 steps on the Sabbath. Only allowed to do this or the other. But they'd find a way to change things. And by the way, we do the same thing. We do. I mean, it's easy to see it in somebody else. So all Scripture is God-breathed. That's what Jesus said and is correcting for correcting and reproof. In Matthew 5.30, he goes on. He says, you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is the fifth time he says it. We'll do one more next week. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This comes 
from one of the oldest laws on humanity's record, from the Babylonians, way back, even before, uh, even before Moses wrote the, in, the, in the law. This was something that was in that area of the world. Well, they, basically, it's called lex talonius, if I said it correctly. It means lex law talonius retaliation. There was actually a law written, and so people think an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. We think that if you knock your tooth out, you knock your other person out. No, it was not a, it was not a directive to do exactly that. It was a governor. You don't go any further than that. In fact, it was not for interpersonal relationships. If you look at it in the scripture, it was for the law of the judges of the time. So in other words, what would happen is this. For example, if you, this is what happens in Afghanistan, for example. If someone kills someone's brother, you kill my brother, I'll kill your family. They go and wipe out the family. Then the family's wiped out. I'm going to get back at the other guy, so I'm going to wipe out a whole city. And it escalates and escalates and escalates. Well, one of the foundations was you cannot penalize something more than the crime committed. So it was actually an act of mercy, though it seems like it's crazy. No, it's not saying, and very few times, by the way, that the law of Moses make this happen exactly like that, that you cannot go any further than an eye for an eye and a tooth by tooth. So fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he's caused disfigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. Okay, this again, this is the, the law of the Old Testament, the law of a nomadic tribe in the wilderness. Remember we, everybody, I'm gonna just go back here again. I'm just gonna mention it because... There's so much confusion about this. It bears repeating, okay? People confuse all the time. Well, so the Bible says you're not supposed to have shellfish. Therefore, you know, the Bible says you shouldn't do this the other. So therefore, since we have shellfish today, it's okay for this to happen today. Remember, we talked about this. There are basically three types of law. There's, there, is, there is ceremonial law. Ceremonial law is how you have church, how you cut the animal up, how do you make the tabernacle, all that kind of stuff. Then you had civil law. Civil law was the, like we have laws in the United States, the civil law. It was a nomadic tribe in the wilderness that was in captivity for 430 years. These people were slaves, and they were running around now in the wilderness, and they had, a, they had civil law and the laws of the day, how it worked for them. Ceremonial law changes, even though it's, it's a type and a picture of what Jesus would do later. Civil laws, some of them we observe today, some of them we don't. But what does not change is the third type of law. That's called moral law. What's right and wrong, thou shalt not murder. You can see it in the Ten Commandments. So don't let people fool you. Say, well, you can't have shellfish. No, the Bible says murder is murder. You, you guys follow me. I, I need you to bring it up again because I hear this over and over and over again. So as he's caused this freement of a man, so shall be done to him. He says again in Deuteronomy 19.21, your, your eye shall not pity, life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And what does Jesus say? But I tell you, not to resist the evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. What on earth is Jesus talking about? Are we supposed to, what happened to Buffalo? Are we just, oh, just let the person do it? Is that what Jesus is saying? That we're just to sit by and, and not do anything about it? What's all this mean? Do not resist the evil person. We're going to break this down in a few moments. Let me just continue to read this first. Let me explain to you what it meant, by the way, to slap someone on their right hand. You would take your hand and you'd slap someone on the backside of the hand on their right cheek. It was an insult beyond insult. It's been written that people would rather be whipped with whips than to be mistreated like that. I don't know if you remember the story when... George W. Bush was in Iraq, and a journalist took shoes off and threw it at him. And he kind of went like this. He was pretty agile, actually. He's pretty impressive. And he, he avoided getting hit by two shoes, which was, a, which was a Middle Eastern way of such disrespect. And for all you people that grow up in the Spanish culture, you know about the chunkla. Okay. Three people understood that one another time. But to slap someone like that was so disrespectful. It's, and basically, you can't allow, they, he disrespected me. And many of us, this is what happens in marriages. This happens in relationships all the time. If your wife gives you the cold treatment, then I'm going to give her the freezer treatment. 
If she gives me the freezer treatment, I'm going to the North Pole treatment. And so we, we escalate it so. I'm not yelling. This is not yelling. This is yelling. I mean, right? I mean, stuff begins to happen in the family. Some of you are quiet. Some of you are ice. Some of you are very fiery. But since you treated me this way, I'm going to do this. And we do it all the time. Kids do it all the time. Well, why does Johnny do that? It's not fair. Since you did this, I'm going to do this to you. And this escalates, happens in interpersonal relationships. It happens especially in marriages, right? The people we love the most, we treat the worst. Do not resist the evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek also? I mean, how is that supposed to work? You know, I heard of a, of a person named Dick Weaver, Pastor Dick Weaver. He, was, uh, he gave his life to Christ in 1852. He was born in England, and at the age of nine years old, he worked in the coal mines. And by the age of 13, he was a prolific drinker. Well, he ended up being a brawler later on. Big, burly guy, kind of like me. Really big, big, strong, muscular. And he would do street fighting. And, I mean, no one could take him down. He was like a Mike Tyson of the street, Mike Tyson in his prime. And so, anyhow, in 1852, he gets his life to Christ. In 1859, there was a revival going through England. Well, this guy, Dick Weaver, became a street preacher, from a street fighter to a street preacher. And what happened was, some guy came up to him and said, Hey, the Bible says, if I strike you in the right cheek, you're to turn the other one. And so, listen, the Bible doesn't mean that actually totally all the time, but in this instance... Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I, I don't think I'd be that Holy Spirit filled to do that. So Dick says, okay, go ahead. Knock that thing off my shoulder. Right? Go ahead. So that the man kind of goes up and whacks him in the face, and Dick goes back like that. And he says, here, do the other one. And the man didn't do it. Two years goes by. He's in Liverpool, and all of a sudden, this young man comes up to him and says, you remember me? He says, I don't remember who you are. A couple of years ago. I told you that I could punch you in the right face. Would you turn the other cheek? He says, I've given my life to Jesus. And part of what you did made me re-examine what I believed. Because you are a man of your word. Now, I'm not suggesting we do that for everybody. There are times for self-defense and there are times not for self-defense, which we're going to break down in a few moments. We're going to look at what it means and what it doesn't mean. But I just want to go through the scriptures here first. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic... Let them have your cloak also. Back in those days, what would happen was this. A lot of people, they'd, wear, they'd do layers. So you had an outer cloak, which is an expensive one. It was like your, kind of like a sleeping bag, if you will. It's what you slept with. People didn't have a lot of clothes back in those days. So if you were sued, you were allowed to take someone's, some, someone's uh, tunic, but you had to give it back by the end of the night so they could have something to sleep with. Jesus says that they asked for your tunic, give them your cloak also. I mean, go the extra mile, which we're getting to right now. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. You see, you have to understand, everybody, they, the Jewish people were living under Roman subjugation, and they were mistreated. They, were, they, were low, they didn't have the same rights and privileges as Roman citizens did. And so they were mistreated. And so what a Roman soldier could do, you ever see the TV programs where they, they drive up and the guy gets out of the car? FBI, give me your car. Right? You never saw that? Okay. Well, back in those days, the Roman, uh, they'd say this, I want you to carry my backpack for a mile. And by law, you had to do, do a thousand steps. So after that, you could stop it and say, okay, I did my thousand steps. Here you go. And the Roman guard would, Roman soldier would put a sword to the back of your neck, said, I want you to carry this for me. And so you'd carry it. And so most of us say, okay, I'll do my thousand steps and I'm done. I'll do my mile and that's enough. Jesus says, go to. How about if you're mistreated at work? What happens if you're mistreated with someone else? Go the extra mile. That will blow people away. Again, we could go on and on about this, but we're going to break it down some further in a few moments. It's give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So what, what happens if you, I mean, I'm seeing it all around. It's very, it's very concerning, everybody. I, I see people, when I go to the West Farms Mall or someplace like that, they're on corners, need food, need food, need food. It's, you're seeing it more and more and more. What do you do? Are you put your window down and just give them all your money? Or what? I mean, remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler? What did he say to him? He says, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, then follow me. If I take that scripture verse, cut it out of its context, pull it out, 
then all of us should sell everything we have and give it to the poor. Is that what Jesus was saying? No. The rich young ruler, that was his parable. But you and I must be willing to let everything go. So here you have asking the question, what are you to do? Well, we've had people often come to our church, and they'll ring the bell, they'll call us and say, I, and they always come up with these crazy stories. My mother is, is dying in, in Philadelphia. I need gas money, and I need, can you give me some money? And I said, no, I will not give you money, but I'll drive you down to the gas station, and I'll put gas in your car. Oh, no, no, that's all right. And they walk away. Hey, I need some money for food. Well, we, I have some food here. We have a food pantry. And by the way, I'm going to stop here, pause for a second as I'm running out of time. Um, we really want to ramp up. I'm just saying this as a public service announcement. I, I do believe we're coming into days where we're going to be food shortages. Uh, people in the futures market are telling us this. I want to make sure Cornerstone Church is ready to help people with food. And so if you're interested in helping us with that, we're just brainstorming and praying and asking God what we can do. We want to be a resource center to help people when difficult times come with food shortages. Just like we saw with the, with the formula, we believe it's coming with the food as well. And it's not just based on prophetic insights, based upon what we see in the markets. And we also sense something's going to happen. So we want our church to be ready. So if you're interested in that, please put in a connection card. Now back to our previously scheduled program. <laughs> give to him an ass. So what do you do? So if I give somebody money and they go out and shoot fentanyl or smoke weed or do something like that. It's not going to help them, right? So if your benevolence hurts somebody, that's not love. The Bible says in Thessalonians, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So there's responsibility. But don't quote that verse first, investigate with an open heart. And maybe God is going to have you do something that's reckless to help someone else come to know Christ. Now, what Jesus' words don't mean is this, okay? First one, prohibition of self-defense. He's not saying you're not supposed to defend yourself because you're to love yourself as you love your neighbor, right? And so you're to take care of yourself. In fact, Jesus' disciples had, had swords. They did. Jesus said, you have one sword, buy two. And then Peter misunderstood it, and he cut the um, servant's ear off, Malchus, and as a result, that was the wrong time. But they had swords. They had robbers around there. They had swords in those days. She's not saying that. Okay, you're, it's okay to self-defense. Even the apostle Paul, he was beaten. And he says, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do this to me. I, oh, we didn't know you're a Roman citizen. So the apostle Paul protected himself. Okay, to, to see someone being uh, abused and not do anything is wrong. If someone, like, for example, I'm in my house at night and I hear some scurrying in the kitchen and I, I go there and I find a burglar, I'm going to get that frying pan and hit him over the head. And once I tie him up with a bicycle chain, I'll feed him breakfast, pray for him, <laughs> and call the police, praise the Lord. So it's not, we're not saying that you're supposed to do nothing. In fact, it would be wrong for us not to protect other people. It would be absolutely wrong. So evil should not be resisted. So we just should let whatever happens, happens. Or just say, what will be is what will be. It is God's will that they go through this. I don't know why I'm using a British accent, but it sounds more official. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pacifist during the World War II era. He was against war. But he began to realize that the evil that Hitler was doing was so bad that he realized his interpretation of Scripture was not correct completely. This is what he said. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is, wait, not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. So what is this all about? Well, right now, for example, I, the personally, I, I'm concerned, personally, for me, I think all of us need to be cared about this, I care about the most vulnerable in society. And I would say the elderly are vulnerable in our society. There's a movement right now, they call it Death with Dignity, where, hey, mom and dad, you know, you got grandchildren. We're struggling with the economy right now, and you know, Dad, you, you don't, you're not firing on all your cylinders, and Mom, you can barely walk, and you're in a lot of pain. 
It's costing about 100 grand a year for your health care. And we want you to have a life that's worth living. You know, we take the dog to the, you know, we take the dog to the vet and put him down when he's, you know. So this is, this is good. So, and meanwhile, mom and dad, maybe they're not quite all, their faculties are not quite all there. And so, hey, just sign this piece of paper, mom and dad. Listen, Junior wants to go to college. We need to buy a house. And you're hurting everybody. An act of love? Why don't you decide when you die instead of happening? Wouldn't it be better to know when you're going to die rather than it just happen? So there's this wonderful program they have. We're going to send counselors to your house for, for a couple weeks and just to talk about this, and then we're going to have you sign this piece of paper. And uh, it's going to be one of one of a party first, and then we're just going to lay you down, give you a little injection, go for a little nap, and then you'll wake up the other side perfectly fine. No, you think I'm making this stuff up? I'm not making this stuff up. In Washington State, it's legal to do that. And other countries, other states in the United States, other countries are doing this as well. It's called death with dignity, which is basically euthanasia. Okay, not euthanasia, euthanasia. Killing, killing somebody. So we have the people at the end of life. And then we have people before they're even born. John the Baptist was in Elizabeth's womb. She was six months pregnant. Mary came to visit her. It says in the scripture that John the Baptist leapt in the womb and was filled with the Holy Spirit while he was a fetus. It's a baby. It's a human life. Yeah. Well, Pastor, you're getting political. I'm not getting political. I'm getting biblical. Okay? What we got to be very careful about is this. We speak God's truth. We are salt and light. But I will not put a Democrat banner on a Republican banner. I am a citizen of heaven, and I'm going to inform these different parties what they're doing is wrong. Don't let yourself be put into a category, and then they, they, they get, oh, you're a right winger. No, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I'm biblical, not political. So here's a man of great courage, and he actually tried to be part of an assassination attempt upon Adolf Hitler. So this is what happened to him. You see, prohibition is not of self-defense. Not to take care of my family would be wrong. Evil should be resisted. And, I mean, think about it. What did Jesus do in the temple? They were taking advantage of the poor people. They were making money in the temple. Well, Jesus, what are you going to do? What will be is what will be. Let it be. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. <laughs> no, he didn't sing a Beatles song. Wasn't he? No, what did he do? He turned over the, he made sure that justice was correct. How about this? We don't want to punish. No, 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 no. Let him off the hook. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. You go, you go rob a store, take money, and, and, you know, destroy someone's livelihood. Go out in the street. It's fine. Oh, you murder someone? Hey, listen, we know you have a, you had a genetic predisposition toward violence. You can't help it. You were born with a criminal gene. So this is the way you are. We're going to have a special flag for you. We're going to have a white and black flag, like, 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 you know, like, a, like stripes, like a prison cell. And we're going to put that out there, and we're going to have a, we're going to have a prison pride month where... Uh... Okay, don't punish. Don't punish. Let every soul be, what does the word of God say? Here we go, Romans 13, one through five. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Okay? And by the way, when the apostle Paul wrote this, uh, we had bad government. We have pretty good government here, by the way. You may not like the gas prices and all that, but compared to what they were going in those days, uh, how about lighting you in fire? You worried about gas prices? They were put on the stake and burned. They were torn from their families. They would take horses and 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 impale you, and, and they would take one horse or run one way, one in the other way, and they'd rip you apart. That's the kind of things they used to do to Romans. And they also invented a thing called crucifixion. In fact, Jesus, we have these pictures of Jesus high aloft in the air. Now, more than likely, Jesus was about four or five feet from the ground like this, naked. And they could spit at him. They could slap his face. The animals could jump on him. 
That was the things they used to, Romans used to do. And within that context of an evil government like that, look what the Apostle Paul has to say, okay? Before we get into all this political movement, we want to be biblical, not political. Is that clear, everybody? Okay? Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Even bad government is better than no government. You want to see no government? My friends, we're not hearing about Haiti right now. It is complete anarchy on the streets. There is no authority. Gangs rule. It's better to have a dictator than to have anarchy on the streets. I'm not suggesting that dictators are good. But not having government is not good at all, right? Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. That's correct. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be afraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he, that's a government, is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword. They had execution back in those days for murderers. He does not bear the sword in vain, for he's God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Thank God for the laws we have in this land to protect us. Is it perfect? No. Go to other countries in the world and see what happens. Justice goes to the highest bidder. I've been in other countries. All you got to do is throw, take some pesos at them or give them some money. Okay. A lot of, you know, thank God we have this, everybody. Okay? Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but for, for because of conscious sake. And then it goes on to say, pay taxes unto who taxes are due. Give honor to who to honor is good. Do. Oh. But it also says in the scripture, in the book of Acts, they told Peter not to preach the gospel. It says, whether it's right or wrong, we must obey God rather than man. And they took the consequences. So we have a right to disobey respectfully when we're told to do something that's against God. God is all final authority. When our covering is ungodly, we have a right to civil disobedience. Uh, we could go on. By the way, this, I'm not going to be able to cover this adequately there's a, yeah, but, I know there's a lot of yeah, buts, but we don't have time for that this morning. I'm giving a general overview of this, okay? So, therefore, you must be subject not only because of the wrath, but because of conscious sake. Repay no one evil for evil, says in Romans. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men, if it's possible. Now, why would he say if it's possible? Because it might be impossible. If it's possible... As much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. <clears throat> Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place for wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God will take care of it. Case in point, we're reading through the Bible in a year, if you're with us. David was mistreated by Saul. He said, I will not touch God's anointed. And God took care of Saul. God takes care of Joseph in prison. God will take care. Let me share your story a little bit. What happened to us a number of years ago. I grew up in a pastor's home. My dad was a Presbyterian pastor. Uh, we used to, you know, uh, and so that's what happened. And he was, uh, we were pastoring a church. We had a youth pastor, kind of like Eli, which we're going to talk more about next week. We're so excited to have Eli and Michaela here today. God bless you guys. And the two beautiful children. Brooklyn and Samuel, so we're so glad you're here today, and we believe in the next generation is extremely important, and as a church, we have to do everything we can do to make sure that baton is passed on well, and that we equip the next generation to run higher and farther than we ever dreamed possible. That's one of the purposes of Cornerstone Church. We're believing out of this place, we're going to see multiple, multiple young people raised up to make a difference in the world, from being doctors and lawyers to ministers and missionaries, and we're going to invest in that because that's what God's called us to do.
Where was I? <laughs> uh, oh, yes. So my father was a youth pastor. And this youth pastor began to pray for the kids. The kids were on drugs and all kinds of things. They're promiscuous. They gave their lives to Christ. They laid hands on them. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They began to uh, have glossia. They began to speak with other tongues. They began to pray for each other. They began to prophesy. Great things were happening in the youth group. It was growing. And the millionaire board, uh, presbyter board member, it's a, it's a congregational form of government, basically said this to my father. Uh, <coughs> none of this here right now. You need to fire that youth pastor. Why? What he's doing is wrong. No, it's not. It's scriptural. said, so do not forbid in church. This is biblical. I cannot, and I cannot fire him. It's wrong. Then you're next. Another board member said, I'd rather have my daughter on drugs than, than be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Guess what happened to their daughter? <clears throat> Tried to commit suicide three times and went insane. Be careful. So this is what happened. Uh, it was difficult. My father said, I'm sorry. I must obey God rather than man. This is biblical. And so my father refused to fire him. So he said, you're next. So then for they trump up all these charges against us. And this is why I didn't like the church for a period of time, by the way. And, and my dad, uh, I wish he'd fight back. I was frustrated. I want him to fight back. I want him to be Italian, you know. Revenge is best served cold. You know, I was all for that. And he didn't do it. And it, 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 I'll be honest, I was offended by my dad. I was. And this happened over and over again to my father. It happened again later on where he was in another church and then people started railroading him and he just sat down. I mean, I, I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? And, but then I see back what happens later on. So anyhow, they leave. My dad begins another church. Not, he was called to another church. Well, one of the board members, the elders, <laughs> watch out for those demons, oh, I'm sorry, deacons and elders. Um, anyhow, they were our best friends until we didn't do what they said. And by the way, that happens a lot. People like, anyhow. So all of a sudden, we started getting like flat tires. Like, what the heck's going on with our car? We, oh, oh, honey, you know, I was like, watch where you're driving the car, honey. Okay, we get the tire fixed, new tire is destroyed. A couple months go by, it happens again. Next thing you know, we're getting all these magazines that you don't want to have delivered to your house. We start getting these phone calls in the middle of the night. And this is before caller ID. And, uh, and it was bad. And, and every couple of months, it's like, what's going on? We get these flat tires, and there'd be nails and screws in our driveway. We'd have to do it. It kept on happening. My mother said, enough. Enough. Something's not right here. And she said, let's pray. So we pray. My, fa my father said, let's pray. So we pray as a family around the dinner, dinner table. My dad said, enough. Let's pray. My mother said, my mother had a word of knowledge, which she had. Then the Holy Spirit kind of gave her insight. She says, they're coming tonight. Tonight's the night. How do you know? I just know. So, dun, dun, da, dun, 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 da, dun, da, da, da. So I, I got my black stuff on. You know, I'm in the bushes. We're hanging out. I'm like, mom's crazy. Nothing's going to happen. It's 9 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. You know, back when I was growing up, they used to have in Channel 5, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your kids are? <laughs> yeah, I'm in the bushes with black on. So we're sitting there, and it's dark and on Bayberry Avenue in Garden City, and all of a sudden, there comes a car, a Volkswagen, you know, sounds like, <laughs> anyhow, comes up, he opens the window, and he throws nails and screws in the driveway. My brother is waiting in his 69 Camaro 350. Anyhow, he takes up after him, he gets his license plate, my brother wants to take him down. My brother is, my brother is Italian, <laughs> and... Uh, I can beat him up now, I think. Uh, anyhow, so we get the plate number, and uh, my dad says, no, no more. So we get the plate. We call the police. The police knock on his door, and he's confronted what he did. And I was like, let's sue his pants off. My guy said, no, we're not going to sue him. We're just going to say, we forgive you. We ask you to stop doing this. And I was agitated. I was. I was, I was ticked off. And, uh, and so what happened to this man? God said, he said, he doesn't repent. God will take care of him. He died four years later. Horrific cancer. Guys, I'm not trying to scare you, but my respect for my father went up another level. Like, oh, my God. And my father says, we're not rejoicing in this. Don't rejoice in this. But God will take care of us when we do the right thing. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. 
We don't want anyone to die of cancer. We don't want anyone to, their daughter to go to a saint asylum. No. But God will take care of you. Do not let bitterness get into your heart. Trust God. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. We're going to break this down some more next week. How to, how to deal with people that hate, that hate you and you hate. Listen, everybody, we need to change the way we're doing things. The church needs to stand in a different capacity. We can overcome evil by good. The Christian church overcame the Roman government by doing radical kindness, radical love. And we're, next week, we're going to break it down some more. Let's bow our heads and pray for a moment, please. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way as well. I'm not quite sure where you're at today. But maybe you have revenge in your heart. You're really hoping this person dies. You're hoping your ex gets theirs. You're hoping your dad or your mother are hurt bad. Maybe, maybe this morning you're thinking about a uh, pastor you used to work under and, or be, be under, and you just hope the worst for that person. We, you hope his church closes. You hope think bad things happen to him or her. Maybe it's a for, former employer. Maybe it's a former employee. Maybe you hate the president of the United States so much that you hope ill comes to him. Maybe you hate the last president of the United States and hope ill comes to them. Lord Jesus, we've heard your word today. It's not easy. And Father, we thank you it's impossible to do. However, with you, all things are possible. Thank you, Father, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Lord, what we heard today is a difficult path to take, but it's the path to freedom, a path to life, a path of supernatural blessing beyond the scope of this planet. And Lord, we choose today to let go of revenge. Lord, we choose to do the right thing in Jesus' name. Father, I pray you'd heal people today. Father, I pray for marriages where one spouse gets up on the other one. Well, you did that, I'll do this. I pray, Father, we'd stop the nonsense and we would choose peace. We choose respect. We would choose forgiveness. For Father, if it was not for your mercy, which of us could stand today? In Jesus' name, amen.